worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship me. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, worship your holy You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart.
smiling down on me When the world's all as it should be Blessed be your name Blessed be your name On the road marked with suffering Though there's pain in the offering Blessed be your name
called nacker, but it, it coats the sand or the food. And that kind of makes the, the irritation go away. And so it, the oyster likes that, and it secretes a little more, and a little more, and a little more. And eventually, that little piece of sand is covered with this material. And if you were to open the oyster up, you get a pearl. And that's where pearls come from. But in our lives, sometimes things happen and something gets inside. Like maybe it's, maybe it's something that, that's painful or maybe someone says something and it's hurtful or maybe you see something and, and it just kind of shocks you and you don't like it. Well, the interesting thing is God in, in some ways acts like, like an oyster and that God then gives us love and gives us more love and gives us more love and more love and more love. And it just kind of completely wraps around whatever in your life isn't supposed to be there. And it makes, or at least it helps to make the pain go away. So this morning, I want you to know that you are completely coated in God's love. That God's love is, is all inside you and that everything is where it should be. And God is so, so delighted that he can take away your pain. So when you go home and you see maybe something like this on, on your mom's dresser, or you get a, a nice set of costume jewelry like this one, or whenever you go to the restaurant and you see oysters or your parents eat, oy have they ever eaten oysters? No, no, okay. <laughs> or when something bad happens and you feel a little discomfort, you feel some pain inside, I want you to know that God loves you very much. And God will do everything possible to make sure where you are where you should be and to coat you in love. Let us pray. I'll say a sentence, and then you say a sentence. God, we thank you for loving us so deeply and for always being with us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are going to children's choir, Miss Laura is right here. Otherwise, find your parents. Well, we're looking forward this afternoon to the children's musical. It is at four o'clock. Um, uh, I have a little special prayer going today that by five till four the rockets will have uh, fixed it all. And it's going to be so far ahead, you don't have to worry about it. Can um, we turn us to uh, Romans chapter five this morning? St. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that sufferings produce perseverance. Perseverance, character. Character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given through us. You see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, but for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It was the poet, Alexander Pope, who first coined the phrase in his essay on man, hope springs eternal in the human breast, he wrote, man never is, but always to be blessed. 
And sure enough, if there's one thing we all need in this chaotic and convoluted world, sometimes it is genuine hope, isn't it? I think of the four older ladies who lived in, in retirement home. They were sitting around one day when a nurse brought in a brand new man into the facility. He was quite dapper for an old guy. <clears throat> so one of the ladies asked him where he had been for so long. He, he replied by saying he had been in prison for 25 years for killing his wife. <laughs> to which the woman perked up a little bit. She smiled and said, so, you're single then. <laughs> Hope springs eternal in the human heart. <laughs> On the other hand, there's perhaps something so devastating as having lost hope. Uh, that happens to all of us sooner or later. Maybe it's so simple as being a sports fan and having your hometown team pick it on the chin in a critical game. It makes you so suspicious that even though the Rockets and Astros were both doing great right now, like myself, you still may remember past Houston nose dives, and so you're just a little bit nervous. Maybe it's a bit more serious. You may have known a financial setback. Or like our friends over at the Bluebell factory lost your jobs this week. Even worse, you may have lost all of your possessions due to a tornado which struck the little town of Van up in East Texas. We used to live about 10 miles from here. There. The board chairman of the Methodist Church, who was married to the former secretary of that church, both died in that tornado. Um, the youth director of the Methodist Church in Van uh, had his house destroyed. Maybe you just died inside. Perhaps you lost your marriage. Or you lost your family. You may have had the person that you trusted the most in this world betray you, uh, leading you to wonder if there's anyone you could ever trust again. Maybe even leading you to wonder how you could ever even go on in life. Because you see, when you lose hope, you really do lose everything, don't you? Which is why when St. Paul wished to give us the therefore of the Christian faith, after having spent four, the first four chapters in Romans uh, dealing with the meaning of righteousness and of justification, he does so by saying that since we have indeed been, been justified through faith, that we now have peace with God. That is to say, we are no longer in a state of rebellion and warfare against Him. It's like an armistice has been signed and the war is over. So in turn, we are called to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Literally, to exult in it. Kuthumetha. It's what the, what the band does up here every Sunday. Kuthumetha, exulting, rejoicing. It means not so much to boast, you, you, you can't translate it that way, but it means really to simply live in an unshakable confidence that what we believe in is actually true. In consequence of our being saved by Christ, in fact, Paul goes so far as to say that we have such a hope we ought to, we ought to enjoy it then. We ought to even rejoice in our sufferings. You say, wait a minute, that can't be right, can it? Who rejoices in sufferings? Who rejoices in all the good stuff? Not when things are going bad. Or in the words of Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, when you're hemmed in with troubles, there are a whole lot of preachers out there this morning who will tell you God wants us to live trouble-free lives. He wants us to be healthy and wealthy and blessed and the best and happy and clappy. <laughs> Want to live in these, doing what we please, richer than the bees are in honey, never growing old, never growing uh, being cold, only pots of gold from thin air. But notice that Paul is taking us somewhere else in his thinking here. He says we, we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, that is patience and endurance, and that constancy, and that perseverance produces, in turn, uh, it literally, it's cutter, outside, it's ergonomics, it comes from that, it's, it, it's what works, it's what produces things. It forges character, a quality within us which has been tested and tried and approved, and then that character produces our results in hope, he says, this condition of alert expectancy within us which enables us to anticipate the future, not with dread, but with confidence and with pleasure. He said that in the last 20 years of his life, 
Renoir, the famous French artist, developed a disease uh, that tormented him almost constantly. He had a painful condition of arthritis that left him in a wheelchair, played into the tip of his fingers. Every time he painted, every stroke of the brush meant grimacing pain for him because of his ailment. It took him quite a long time to ever finish a painting. He had to have his assistant put the paintbrush in his hand for him. Uh, once one of his friends stopped by and he consoled him and he said, you should stop painting, August. You should just uh, shift your passion and you put the arts over to focus on your health. <clears throat> there was a great struggle against pain whenever he held his brush. But Renoir, with a great display of passion, answered, the pain passes away, but the beauty remains. That's what Paul is saying here, isn't it? The pain will ultimately pass away, but the beauty of that character that it produces in us will remain. For hope, so the good apostle asserts in verse 5, does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Peterson paraphrases it this way. He says, we can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives. And that's truly good news this morning, isn't it? It means, once again, that this Christian life is essentially a life of hope. And I don't mean just close your eyes and hope that everything works out in the end. <laughs> Pollyanna belief. This is a hope which is grounded always in God and who he is, and what he's willing to do for you and for me. If you look it up, you'll discover the word hope appears 52 times in the New Testament. Now, the pita is the, is the Greek word. Every single time, it is, it is connected in some way to God. According to St. Paul, at least God is the author of hope. That's to say, he's the source of it. And in turn, Christ going in us is the hope of glory. Over and over again, our hope is connected with the relationship that we may have with Jesus Christ. And so no matter how deeply some may try to bury it, the poet was right. Hope springs eternal in the human heart. Gilbert Chesterton once suggested, hope means hoping when things are hopeless or it is no virtue at all. As long as matters are really hopeful, hope is mere flattery or platitude. It's only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to be a strength. We go a little further in Romans, and you will find in chapter 8, Paul says our present sufferings are not even worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed in us. For all creation, Paul says, is waiting in eager expectation um, for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. The paraphrase how like says, all creation is straining on tiptoe just to see the children of God come into their own. We're going to come back to that, to this chapter in uh, two weeks. But I have to tell you now that, that I really, really love this, this idea. It comes from the term that means to stretch your neck in anticipation. You ever, have you ever done that? Maybe at the airport? And you're waiting for somebody to come home on a plane? You stretch to see if your loved ones are coming down that hallway? Whenever our daughter comes from England, we, uh, we stand behind the international arrivals door and every time it opens, we look down to see if, they're, if, they're, if she's down the, down the aisle somewhere. Well, I think of how many years ago when she went up to Canada, that's a Christian camp up in Missouri. Well, we went to pick her up after her week there. And, uh, and all the parents uh, had to stand behind a rope, looking down a road. Uh, leading to the camp. Uh, every one of us was straining and stretching uh, to, to get that first glimpse of our child. You know, the one that would tell you, was it a good week or was it a bad week? <laughs> Creation's doing that very same thing. Staying on tiptoe to see. Waiting for you and me, for the children of God, for the sons and daughters of the Almighty to come into their own. See, hope is that which connects us to the future, just as memories tie us to the past. 
There might be valleys in the days ahead, as there were valleys in the past, but the hope that we have in Christ Jesus makes us realize that one day we will stand on the holy mountain of God, reigning with Christ, beautifully adorned as a bride for the bridegroom. So if we're not quite there yet, it's okay, isn't it? Just have to hang on sometimes. So I want to tell you, one day, someone is going to hug you so tight that all of your broken pieces will stick together. We are surrounded by the grace of God. Even when we don't know it. Even when we think that life has gotten fairly hopeless. John Wesley might have thought that. He was the son of a clergyman, the grandson of a clergyman. He'd already been ordained in the Church of England himself. He'd come to America to serve as a missionary. Uh, did not go well. Now, what I used to say that Wesley set out to be a failure as a missionary and he succeeded brilliantly. <laughs> Found himself struggling to find the kind of relationship with God that he knew he didn't have. He had met a group of Christians from the Central European area of Moravia. He had seen in them both a fervency and an assurance that he knew was in his heart. And then one night, 277 years ago this week, John Wesley went very unwillingly, he says, very unwillingly, to one of the Moravian meetings, a little nonconformist, non Anglican chapel on Aldersgate Street in London. There wasn't even a preacher that night. Someone was just reading from the preface to the book that Martin Luther, the reformer, wrote, a commentary on the book of Romans. But when Wesley heard Luther's words, something changed in him. Luther suggested that faith is not human notion and dream that some hold for faith. He said, rather, faith is a divine work in us. It changes us, makes us to be born anew of God. It kills the old Adam, makes altogether different men in heart and spirit and powers, and brings with it the Holy Ghost. It is a living, busy, mighty thing, this faith. A daring confidence on God's grace. So sure and certain, Luther said, that a man would stake his life on it a thousand times. And this confidence in God's grace and knowledge of it makes us glad and bold and happy in dealing with God and all his creatures. John Wesley wrote in his journal that night that when he heard those words, he felt his own heart strangely warming with the assurance that God had taken his sins away, even his, saved him from the law of sin and death. That moment marked the beginning of the evangelical revival that not only changed John Wesley, but quite literally changed the course of English and then American history. Historians will, will credit the Wesleys with being the one force which prevented England from having the kind of bloody revolutions that France and other countries had in that period of time. Because something happened in people's hearts. John was joined the word by his brother Charles. The two of them, Charles wrote the hymns, as you can see. Uh, and John wrote the theology and the sermons. The Wesley came to understand our hope is not in ourselves. Our hope is not in our circumstances. Our hope is in knowing God is in control. And we can trust him to do what is right, even when we may not have a clue what that is. There's a lot of reasons for hopelessness this morning. There is a big therefore right at the beginning of Romans 5 that tells us you and I can have a hope that does not disappoint us if we put our trust in God. Verse 8 would go on to tell us in Romans 5, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates it. 
Yet it could also translate that Greek term by the word commends. Or as John Wesley read it, God recommends his love for us in this. Wesley said it was the most elegant expression indeed, because those who are wont to be recommended to us are those who have been unknown to us, are separated from us, alienated from us. So you see, without God, we really are hopeless, aren't we? Our lives are not only being apt to be spinning out of control, uh, we're apt to be clueless as to what to even do about it. But once we have been recommended to God, introduced to Him, uh, commended to Him, hope indeed springs eternal in the human rest. So I ask you this morning, what, what are you hoping for today? I hope you're hoping for something. I hope you've not become so jaded in life that all you want to do is just get through it. Click off one more item on the to-do list of your life. What are you hoping for? A reversal in your life of fortunes? A new kindling of an old dwindling flame? A future that is better than your past? May I recommend discovering the love of God in your life. He is hope for even the hopeless. And hope, so the great apostle told us, does not disappoint us. As our ushers prepare to receive our tithes and offerings this morning, I would like to invite you to take the opportunity to complete the, the attendance booklet, which is located down the center aisle of your pews. Uh, here at Christ Church, we truly want to be in relationship with one another, and we want to be able to, to walk alongside one another, um, both in the good times and in the times when we are stretched to our thinnest and may feel hopeless. And it's best to do that if we know one another personally. Let us pray. God of grace, God of glory, God of hope, we give you thanks. We ask for your continued blessings and your wisdom over these resources. Guide us so that we may take them out into the world to serve you and to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. When you talk about um, God reaching out with hope, one of the greatest examples of that and, and a hopeless individual is the thief next to Jesus on the cross. And in Luke 23, 39, it says, One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. i 
work for the best And I know that my time is coming soon Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, remember me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, O God, and on these gifts of bread and unfermented wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would those who are assisting with communion come forward at this time to be served?
If you would please direct your attention to your worship guide, and you'll notice a few things. Uh, these are these are events, these are items uh, that we'd like to bring to your attention, so that if you would like to engage in the church uh, this week, or if you would like to know what's happening, or if maybe you feel, uh, if you have felt your heart strangely warmed and you're looking for an opportunity to plug in to the life of the church, here are a few items. The first, as you'll see just inside the cover, is our children's uh, choir spring musical. This afternoon, as Chapel said, it happens to be very conveniently located in the day right next to the Rockets game. But it is uh, Land of the Lost and Found. It's a beautiful musical this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Please come and support our children. If you'll turn a few pages further, you'll find this page that has all of the announcements. There are many wonderful things happening, including Vacation Bible School sign-ups. We, uh, we would also like to welcome Haley, Haley Sebesta, who is our new children's ministry intern. Um, she's in the room, but I will make you stand up. You can see her picture right here. We are thrilled to have Haley start this week. Uh, Senior Recognition Sunday is this coming Sunday, so please be here and support our seniors. Oh, two weeks, I lied. That's the commandment, I broke it. I'm sorry. Uh, it's in two weeks. And then I would also like to make a special announcement. As you go out today, there's going to be some really fun happenings down in the gathering hall. Yesterday, we had our Change the World weekend, our Change the World endeavor, and there were many mission projects that happened both inside and outside of the church. Well, that, that has spilled over intentionally into Sunday and right outside of Sunday worship. So as you go down, there are opportunities for service, and you are welcome to join in at the tables. Uh, one opportunity will be letter writing to police officers. One opportunity will be making mana bags uh, down, and don't worry, Renee and, and her brilliant volunteers will all be there to coordinate everything. And another opportunity is decorating bags for Kairos, which is our prison, one of the many prison ministry opportunities in our church. And then if I heard correctly right before I came in, there is also the opportunity to take mana bags. And mana bags are bags that are full of very simple resources and necessities that when you find someone out in the world who is homeless, you can very simply to hand them this bag and tell them God loves them and it has water, it has uh, some simple foods, it has wonderful, wonderful things and it's a blessing. So you are welcome to do any of those or take a mana bag with you on your way. I know that's a lot. Finally, I would like to invite you this morning. If you would like to be a member of our church, whether you've been a member before or you've never been a member of a church ever anywhere, uh, you are invited to join our church family. We would love to come alongside you and to walk with you in the growth of your faith. So if you would like to join our church, please come forward and speak to a pastor while we sing this final song. Please stay. Christ the real 
streams flow as one river to wash away my broken. Here we see that God, you are moving. A time of jubilee is coming when you're the Lord returns to Jesus. Bring wine to heavenly gates. Bring them away of the risen Lord. The risen Lord. Open up the doors and let the music play. Let the streets resound with singing. Songs that bring your hope and songs that bring your joy. Dancers dance upon each other. Open up the doors, open up the doors, and let the music play. Let the streets resound with singing. Songs that bring your hope and songs that bring your joy. Dancers who dance upon each other's So, uh, go forth today as people of hope. Uh, go forth uh, with a song in your heart, and with your heart trying to be warm, you're, you're Methodist, you are, you are uh, children of, of the Wesleys, you are, you are those who bear a great heritage of evangelical renewal and hope. Go take it to the countryside. Uh, John Wesley once said that the Methodists only have one mission in life, it is to spread scriptural in us all across the continent. Uh, let's go do that today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.